Ray, all your life you've been involved in some of the most profound aspects of, uh, of living things as a neurologist, a gerontologist, uh, for your career, uh, as a writer dealing with human phenomenology, with death, uh, with the nature of consciousness, uh, uh, all in great depth. So putting on your philosopher's hat, if you try to integrate and look at these things, what are the kinds of deep questions that you can ask about living things, biology, mm -hmm. that, we could, that could help us classify a kind of a new way of, of looking at living things? It seems to me that there's the obvious questions uh, in relation to consciousness, at what level we regard creatures as conscious, living creatures. What would be the symptoms of consciousness, the absolutely reliable symptoms? And I think that's probably a very bad way of putting it, but that's the best way we mm -hmm. could do that. So that's the first thing. You know, I have no doubt at all that dogs are conscious. I'm not too sure the status with snails, and I'm confident that amoeba are not conscious. So I think that's the first question. And it related to that is the question of how on earth does consciousness arrive in living matter? And what on earth, what's the purpose it serves? If you were really serious about replication, you'd just rely on the unbreakable laws of nature. You wouldn't have something as stupid as consciousness to <laughs> guide behavior. I mean, it's a completely ridiculous thing to do. People are given all sorts of reasons, but actually consciousness is quite indefensible as a way of reassuring replication. Of course, once you're conscious, it's a good idea to stay that way because you rely on consciousness then to guide you to the world. So that's the question, one of the questions that intrigues me. Another really interesting question, it seems to me, for philosophy of biology, is how organisms cohere. I mean, all my life I've been working with biological organisms, otherwise known as human beings, and seeing them at different levels. And if you go down to the lowest level, the level of the individual cell, and you look at what's going on in the cell, any up-to-date account is absolutely dizzying yeah. of all the kinds of interactions. And one of the things I find most intriguing is in order to work as a whole, a cell both has to be a soup, everything's together, but also have structures in it to keeping things apart. And that sort of dialectic between the soup and the, is the scaffolding is a problem I think that biologists don't address enough because it raises at that level the larger question of how does an organism work together? How does it cohere? How do all of those things um, that necessarily work together do so. And you may say, well, of course they work together. It's a necessary condition of survival. Yes, but that even makes it more interesting because how was it that evolutionary processes produce something so complex as an individual cell, never mind something like you and me? With trillions and trillions of cells all working together in some strange and marvelous ways. And working at many, many levels right. and, and cohering at many levels. Mm. And um, what's another area? You, we talked about uh, hierarchies in, uh, in biology. Uh, is, what's the significance of that? Well, I think it's where we see ourselves uh, fitting into the universe. Naturally, when in the great chain of being from Gunk to Raymond Tallis, Raymond <laughs> Tallis puts himself at the top. But the question is, how should we view the evolutionary products? Is it like a bush with lots and lots of mm. endpoints? Or is it like a tree with ourselves at the top? And I think there is a genuine question to be asked in a sort of post-religious post era. Mary Mitchell is a philosopher I admire enormously, and she is very scornful of the notion that we've always put ourselves at the top of the tree. And of course we do, we're marking the exam papers. <laughs> but the fact remains is, uh, I think we need to think about that seriously. What is our relation to the animal kingdom? What rights do we have over them? We certainly have a duty to minimize their suffering, but where does it go beyond that? And so, uh, as you look at these three areas that you've mentioned, uh, consciousness, uh, co coherence, and hierarchies, w what does this tell you about uh, uh, the idea of, a, of an overarching philosophy of biology? I think it's something that we should have as a regulative idea. Otherwise, we'll never get it. I suspect probably biology is intrinsically multiple, diverse, and so on, and deeply empirical. But nonetheless, I think the idea of a philosophy of biology is very important. It's, as Kant once said, you know, truth is the regulative idea of science. And perhaps we need the notion of a philosophy of biology as a regulative idea.